week, we started with this phrase. So if prayer is no longer a how, the main thing is, is it's an if. Will we pray? Because what we talked about the last two Sundays, and last Sunday in particular, was that just bring your authentic self. Don't feel intimidated by the how. And the real question, therefore, is if. And I know that during this season, we've been pressing into a yes to that question. And I think it's brilliant. Really, really good. And in the weeks to come, we're going to start to share, when we come back in February, uh, we're going to start to share some of this movement we're experiencing in our lives, in our city, in our ministries, because we said yes to the if. This morning, I want to give you a powerful reason to say yes to the if. That is why I want to talk about how powerful prayer could be. And I hope to do so briefly because I know the kids are here. Um, but let me just read a couple quotes, if that's okay. Oswald Chambers writes this. The real business of your life is prayer. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. It's interesting, isn't it? We pray before we do something. We pray before this or that. But actually, prayer is the main thing. History, this is a guy named Walter Wink. <laughs> Brilliant. Man. History belongs to the prayers who believe the future into being. By means of our prayers, we veritably cast fire upon the earth and trumpet the future into being. Now that's a really, really big statement. By means of our prayer, we cast fire upon the earth and trumpet the future into being. And then this is Richard Foster from his excellent book, Prayer Finding the Hearts Through Home. If we truly love people, we will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them. That's such an insightful statement. Because we sometimes bloat our own abilities out of the desire to help people. And we think we can make their lives work for them. That's, that's the stuff of do-gooders. That's not the stuff of the kingdom. Kingdom is built on a healthy understanding of self. We will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them. Because that's what love does, right? And this will lead us to... Guess what the next word is? Prayer. Prayer. Thank you, Michelle. You, you're playing with me. I'm so grateful that you're playing with me. Because all these does are just like silent. <laughs> Prayer is a way of loving others. Is that familiar? Really? Isn't that really good? You see, she loves people. And that leads you to prayer because you realize you can't fix their life. Some of you needed to hear that this morning. Your kids, you can't fix them. You can't prepare them enough to face this world. What I want to do this morning is I want to contend for the power of prayer. And we're going to do so from one main passage of Scripture that alludes to another passage of Scripture. But before that I do that, I just want to share a couple um, illustrations with you that lead us on this path, okay? Um, one of the writers of one of the books that uh, we're recommending this month uh, wrote this. The mother of one of my seminary students was a psychic. So, this person who's writing is a professor at the seminary, and uh, one of his students, mom, was, was a psychic. And she said to her son, whose name was Jim, ironically, Jim, have you been praying for me? 
to which Jim, the seminary student, said, of course I have, mother. <laughs> well, don't, she insisted, because you're disturbing my aura. <laughs> then he writes this, I say, pray on. We never know completely the effects of our prayers, but we do know that God includes prayer as part of his strategy for establishing his kingdom and ensuring spiritual victory. One of the most dramatic deliverances I have observed happened in a man who was a high priest in the upper echelons of Satanism. Six months after when he was set free, he gave his testimony in our church. And at the close of his testimony, I asked him, based on your experience on the other side, what is the Christian's greatest strategy against demonic influence? Prayer, he answered forcefully. And when you pray, mean it. Fervent prayer thwarts Satan's activity like nothing else. That's big, isn't it? So, um, we'll stop praying for me. You're disturbing my aura. We need to disturb more auras. Okay? Now this one is shared by Pete Gregg, and, and, I, and I share it with you as a challenging example. Because here's the thing, guys. Um, prayer is not always purely cause and effect. There are a thousand moving parts in it. And sometimes when we talk about answers to prayer or share about prayer and its effect in our lives, the cynics around us, or maybe in us, will go, hmm, how do you know that was the prayer, you know? And what I want to say is what we need to develop in us is a bias for the power of prayer. Okay, that's what I want to feed this morning. A bias for the power of prayer. I don't know how it all works, but I know prayer was a big part of what happened. Yes, sometimes that's the answer. So, uh, Pete Gray shares this. He says, Jonathan, a member of our church who works in London, arrived very early for a meeting in Westminster one morning in August. As he walked across the River Thames on Westminster Bridge towards the Houses of Parliament, are you located in now? Okay, he's on that bridge, Westminster Bridge, walking towards the Houses of Parliament, sees the great castle there, and towards the House of Parliament with two and a half hours to kill, he found himself thinking back to the terror attack that had taken place there the previous year. We all remember that, right? Where, that, where the police officer was, was killed. And as he did so, he says a new, he says, a new and imminent danger so powerfully that it stopped him and he began to pray for protection. Not something he would usually do. And then, instead of going to a coffee shop like he was going to do and killing a couple hours, he continued pacing those streets and praying for an hour. It was so strange and so strong, he recalls. I walked and prayed around that area, praying for the safety of those who work in Parliament and the offices nearby, the hospital over the bridge, and the crowds of commuters. Eventually, around 7.30 in the morning, I stopped praying and stepped into a coffee shop near the bridge. It was just seven minutes later, and 100 yards from where I was sitting, a terrorist drove his car into cyclist pedestrians in the precise place where I had been praying between Westminster Bridge and Parliament. Now, Pete Gray says this, We will never know for sure this side of eternity what difference Jonathan's prayers made that day. But what we do know is that the attack on Westminster Bridge the previous year left 50 people injured and 5 dead. But this incident killed no one and left 3 people with a room minor injuries. Fascinating, isn't it? Now, we've got to see that through the eyes of Scripture and Scripture's opinion of prayer. Okay? Some of us feel like in order to have legitimacy, we have to see it through the eyes of the cynics on YouTube. But you don't. That's their burden to bear, not yours. You need to see it through the truth of Scripture. 
What if Jonathan's prayers made an enormous difference? Like that? Secretly, we wonder whether our little prayers can make any actual difference in the face of vast, intractable problems. Like a relative who is entirely resistant to the gospel, or a terminal diagnosis, or a government that is oppressing its citizens, or the tragedy of a natural disaster. Our whispered prayers can seem feeble, foolish, and futile against the sheer scale of life's troubles. A butterfly confronting a cliff. And yet the Bible teaches that our prayers are vastly powerful. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus doesn't just instruct us to pray personally for daily bread, but also for regime change. The coming of God's kingdom on earth. Prayer has a, uh, the Bible has a high view of prayer. And it will not be something we can enter into if we do not take its lead and its perspective toward prayer. Don't get me wrong, I know it's a mystery. And when he says there, secretly we wonder whether our little prayers can make any actual difference. I, I feel you. Okay? I get that. I get that. I understand that. That's, that's a common experience and feeling. And yet, you live in that, but press towards Scripture's perspective on it. That's how it works. Right? We're not dishonest about it and go, Oh, you know, it's... No, 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 it's fine. I don't have any doubts about it. No, we, we wrestle with these things and we bring them to Him. But we don't let it stop us. That's the really crucial issue. Now, I want to start this morning. I want to look at uh, James chapter 5. So, I don't know if you have a Bible or you use your phone or whatever, but once you flip over to James chapter 5, it's interesting that James talks about prayer here. Because James' nickname in the early church was Old Camel Beats. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard that before? The reason was he prayed so much. He spent so much time on his knees. He wore calluses on his knees. So they called him old camel knees because it looked like a camel's eye. I don't know if they said that to his face, but that's what that's what the nickname they were given to him. So James chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. Okay. The effective prayer of the righteous is very powerful. The effective prayer of the righteous is very powerful. Someone read to me what maybe your version says. Read the whole, read that whole sentence. What's it say? Powerful and effective. What? Any other versions? Because there's some funny words in this in our Bibles. How many have the word effectual? Does anyone have that word? I found that word in quite a, in quite a few versions. This, this is a really important verse, and sometimes the language that our translators use doesn't help us. Okay? The effective prayer of the righteous is very powerful. I think that's a very good um, uh, translation of it. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. With a nature like ours. Okay? What James is trying to say is, he wasn't Superman. Right? He didn't hover instead of walk. It was a block. Okay? And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again. And the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So James is trying to encourage the, the early church to value and answer yes to the if question about prayer. And the reason he's doing this is because it is powerful. Now the actual Greek says this, much powerful the prayer of a righteous being made effective. So 
So here's the key. The righteous one, if they learn how to pray effectively, can see immense power come through that practice. Much power. Much power. The effective prayer of the righteous. What does he mean by the righteous? I don't know about you, but I would never call myself that. Right? Because I just feel like a schmuck most often, right? I'm Jim. I'm not righteous. But you know what? Scriptures tell me I am. Two reasons. First reason is this. Jesus credited all of his good stuff to me. That all got put in my account. So when people look at my accounts, they go, wow. They see all of his good stuff. I didn't earn it. I haven't done it. He just gave it to me through this thing called grace. That's amazing. And that needs to leak down into my and your self-image. Because that is, when you stand before the Father, He's going to say, Well done, good and faithful and righteous one. And it will be Jesus' goodies that allow Him to say that. Okay? You would die because of Christ are righteous. And the second one is this. I'm pressing in through all of my foibles and failures and frustrations to know more of God. I'm just leaning in. I'm leaning towards what He's calling me in. And I'm messing it up almost every day. But I'm still leaning. And that is the second aspect that James is talking about here. He's saying the prayer of someone who's leaning in here is something that can become really, really, really powerful. Much powerful. Right? Not just powerful, but much. The word there you'll recognize, poly. Right? Multiple. Powerful. So, and then he gives the example of Elijah. Before we talk about Elijah, let's talk about this. What is the key to effective prayer? How do we begin to pray effectively? I want you to take two minutes, okay? I'm going to give you two minutes. And I want you to turn to the person next to you, because you're starting to get sleepy. I want you to take two minutes. I want you to turn, and I want you each to share one word as to what you think contributes to prayer being effective. Yeah? Is that cool? Can you do that? Or are you going to do like the comedian and go, I don't know my neighbor? Go ahead, take the other first, and then give one word, one word at least, that helps a prayer be effective. Go on. Okay. Let's have some of those words. Let's share them. Faith. Faith. What's faith? Uh, she's our neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are trusting that it's going to happen. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the, you're trusting that the outcome is going to come. Absolutely. What, are, what, what else? What else? What else? What else helps prayer be effective so that it can be powerful? I think just doing it. Like, just doing it. Right? That's interesting. That's very interesting. Heartfelt. Heartfelt. Good, good. Honesty. Ooh, you guys are so honest this morning. This is great. What? Honesty. Honesty. Authentic. Absolutely. Brilliant. What? Desperate. Desperate. Absolutely. I thought you said sexy. I thought, I'm sure that's involved somewhere. Oh, very good. Absolutely. That feeds faith. Any others that I missed? Love for us. Love? Love driving it. Absolutely. It's really good. It's really good. I mean, I think these are the questions we're often asking. What am I lacking that means prayer isn't powerful in and through my life? Uh oh. The rhinos are stampeding. You're not a rhino. No, you're not. 
<laughs> Do you guys remember George Mueller? You ever, you, uh, uh, who has never heard of George Mueller? It's okay if you haven't. Yeah, it's fine. He, he lived in the 19th century, and he kind of uh, championed um, taking care of orphans in a new and different way. And so he had 10,000 orphans under his care, numerous orphanages, and he had 80,000 day students that would come and be at his uh, facilities. And they never knew how the resources would be provided from one day to the next. George prayed provision for that kind of enterprise on a daily basis. And there were many times when there was no breakfast and they all bowed down in prayer and the milk truck broke down in front of the orphanage at that guy. And he financed El Cien for a while. Did he? So he helped finance the London City Mission that he worked for. Wow. So he's something that knows something about powerful prayer. And in his, um, in his writings, there are five keys to effective prayer that he gives us. Now, what I want you to do is to use your phone and take a snapshot of that. And I'm, I'm going to leave this as homework for you. I'm not going to teach too deeply into this. I'm going to read it and maybe explain it a little bit. But then we're going to stick with this James passage. But I didn't want to give this to you. I want you to go and look at these verses that are connected to each of these answers. And I want you to kind of think, try and understand why George thought that these were keys to effective prayer. This is an authority. Alright? This is someone that lived it, practiced it, experienced it, and we want to learn from them. Okay? So there's a scripture passage for each. And uh, hopefully that will be helpful. So the first one is an entire dependence upon the merits and mediation. Now he's writing in the 19th century, so some of the language is, is a challenge. Um, the merits and mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only ground of any claim for blessing. It's what we were talking about earlier. Because of Christ, I am righteous. Okay. It's Jesus' death and resurrection and perfection counted to my account. That's the only reason I can pray and connect with the Father. Alright? The curtain of the temple has been torn. That's that first one. The second one, separation from all known sin. That's what I'm talking about by leaning in. Are you going to fall on your face sometimes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And His grace is big enough. But where are you leaning? Okay? George found that when he started to lean away, prayer lost some effectiveness in him. Maybe because he was unable to hear the voice of the Lord guiding him a little as clearly. Alright? Faith in God's word of promise. That's the scriptures. Okay? That's the scriptures. If you want to understand what is already yours, become a student of the Bible. Because the Bible is full of things that already belong to you, just waiting for you to claim it. But we don't know how to pray using the Bible. And what God loves is when we take the scriptures and go, you promised me in this verse that this is mine, so I'll have it. Thank you. And he goes, Amen. Well done. You've taken my promise seriously and trusted me. And apply faith. Yeah? Four, asking in accordance with his will, having godly motives. Okay? That's going to be the one we really talk about on the 6th of Feb when we come back. How do we begin to pray in alignment with the will of God? Number five, persistence. Supplication is just another big fancy old-fashioned word for asking. There must be waiting on God and waiting for God. So what he's talking about here is perseverance. Keep plowing. So these are Mueller's five keys to effectiveness. Now what I want to do is go back to this one. And I want to unpick this a little bit, if that's okay. Can we do some Bible study for five minutes? Is that good? You guys alright with that? Okay. 
So this being made effective, right? This the effective prayer. This seems to be the key. And George has given us some insights there that I hope you will spend some more time. What I will do is I'll take that slide and I'll post it on our Facebook group, but I'll also send it to your community leaders. Or if you email me at Jim at Vineyard.com, I'll send it to you directly so that you can work through those if you haven't taken a picture of it, okay? But he says the effective prayer of the righteous, we already know that's us is very powerful. What is an effective prayer according to the text? And that word is energeo. Anyone guess the word that comes from that? Energy. Energeo. It means working in a situation which brings it from one stage to the next. Like an electrical current energizing a wire, bringing it to a shining light bulb. Fascinating. Okay. So what, what is James is telling us here is he's saying, listen, as you begin to pray, electricity begins to flow through you into that situation. And the more you pray, because the word means this, working in a situation which brings it from one stage to the next. So there's a persevering, there's a persistence factor here that is implicit in the word. And it's saying that as the energy enters the circuit, it begins to move through the circuit to the object on the other end of that circuit that it's meant to electrify. Like a light bulb. You hit the switch, we see light instantly, and we forget that something had to travel to animate that electric bulb. And so what the word here in effective prayer means is, Sarah, you nailed it, someone who will just flip the switch. Just start the circuit. It's actually in the Word. It, one translator just say, it, uh, translates it, engaged in. It's not talking about how good you are, how sexy you are. It's just saying, just do it. Nike stole it from James. <laughs> Engaged in. Working in a situation. And what happens is that as you begin, the Lord steers you and guides you. It is the beginning that is the hard part. And the, the how happens if you will just say yes to the if. And the, power, the word powerful here means this. So, if that's the effective, very powerful. Right? The righteous is very powerful. What does that mean? It means this. It refers to the Lord strengthening them with a combative, confrontive force to achieve all he gives faith for. Inherent in the word powerful is warfare. Prayer is war. Prayer is offensive warfare against the darkness. And when he says the effective prayer of the righteous is very powerful, what he's saying is the effective prayer, which means the prayer, the prayer that just gets prayed, is combative and confronts the darkness to achieve God's heart in the world. That's what he means by power. Do you feel like that when you pray? Do you feel like that when you pray? Talk to me. Do you guys feel like you're being combative and confrontational? We know you do, probably. But I'll worry about the rest of you. Occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it rises up in us. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. 
I've done my fair share of ranting and raving in my back garden while praying. I'm trying to tell you guys that you need to understand that you're engaging in offensive confrontation and combat when you pray. The scriptures are telling you that and inviting you to understand that as you pray. Okay, the, the scriptures want to clarify and help you understand what you are doing when you pray. It's so different, isn't it, than our world's understanding of prayer. You know, oh thank you God for the dinner we had tonight. And, you know, this religious ritual that prayer has become is so different from what the scriptures tell us prayer is. What God's heart for prayer is. It is an enormous, enormous thing. So he says this. Then um, James goes on and he begins to talk about Elijah, who was a man with a nature like ours, which means he was a schmuck too, just like you and me. Alright? We have this habit of reading the Old Testament saints as superheroes. As kind of like the Avengers. They're just different. Moses, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, 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 they're different. But actually, you need to understand that they're operating with fewer resources than you have. Right? That's Bill Johnson's favorite little phrase. They weren't born again. And it's absolutely true. These guys are engaged in these things without what you take for granted every single day. The Spirit of the living God lives inside you and me. They didn't have that. And Elijah, who's a bloke like you, or like you know, ladies, apologies, and he prayed earnestly. What does that word earnestly mean? It means not just formally, with the lips only, but with the Spirit with understanding and with the heart engaged in it. Who was that? that was, was that you, Joe? Earnestly. The heart engaged. And with understanding. Now, how did Elijah... The Old Testament is filled with some amazing prayers, isn't it? There's one prayer, and I can't remember who it was. One of you will remember it, correct me. Where someone prays and the sun stops. Who was that? Joshua. Joshua. What? Wow. You know? There's a lot of prayers like that. Moses prayed and, and a seed and like this is like we just they're just like fairy tales to us. But this is what it looks like. Very powerful. This is very powerful. And Elijah prays and it doesn't rain for three years. Now, I would like to learn how to do that prayer. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Maybe just three months. Right? But I would really like that prayer. Especially this time of the year. And so in 1 Kings, it says this. So this is the story. James is uh, referring to a story in 1 Kings. Forgive me, I said 1 Kings. Um, and it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite who was, I wish Tish and Tim were here, because then I could say they're related, right? Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to King Ahab, who was an evil, evil king, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall certainly be neither dew nor rain during these years except by my word. So there's going to be no rain. Now, what gives a Tishbite from Gilead the guts to stand before the king and say, I turned this, this spigot off. No rain. Bye. <laughs> Those are some cojones on them, aren't they? <laughs> Let me tell you. Elijah took seriously two things. The word of the Lord that prompted him and the word of the Lord in Scripture. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 11, this is what's written about Israel. Make sure you do not turn away to serve and worship other gods. 
Then the anger of the Lord will erupt against you, and he will close up the sky so that it does not rain. The land will not yield its produce, and you will soon be removed from the good land that the Lord is about to give you. Then, in chapter 28, Deuteronomy says this again. The sky above your heads will be bronze, and the earth beneath you iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder and dust. It will come down on you from the sky until you are destroyed. Elijah was a student of the scriptures, and he knew. And there was never a king as evil as Ahab. Ahab brought all kinds of foreign gods in, and the people of Israel turned away from Yahweh and began to worship these foreign gods. His wife was a priestess of a foreign god, and he was absolutely polluting Jewish society with this. And Deuteronomy, when they, just before they were to move into the land, gave the promise that if this happens, rain is going to stop. Now, you guys know enough geography to know that that's a really big deal in the Middle East, isn't it? Rain is everything. If it doesn't rain, oops, we're in trouble. There is a rainy season, and it is a godsend every year. So there is this clear sense of blessing or not blessing that is in the rain. And so, in this promise, God connects that blessing to them, saying, connected. It's a pun. Backing lies. Oh, okay, great, thank you. And, excuse And so, Elijah feels prompted by the Lord. The word of the Lord comes to him, and he says, the Father says, you know, you need to go, and you need to give this message to Ahab. It's going to stop. And so based upon sensing the will of the Father, and faith in the Scriptures and their promises, he declares this, and the rain stops. Three years later, this is what happens. Now it happened after many days, three years, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will provide rain on the face of the earth. So James is here saying this. He's saying, listen guys, just like Elijah was a normal bloke, he prayed, and he entered into combat that powerful effective prayer that he brought which is based upon the scriptures it was effective because it was based upon the scriptures and it was informed by what God was doing and therefore the rain stopped for three years he is using that as an illustration for yours and my prayer lives we say that again James is using this story as an anecdote as evidence as illustration for our purpose. There is something so important, so important about prayer. And James is saying, oh, it was only true for Elijah, because he was just a broke kind of human being. But I want you to use that as the standard for you. Now just close your eyes for a second. Because I just want you to do, I just want you to do a little work with that. Alright? Will you receive that word? Will you receive that promise? And will you receive that invitation and challenge? from the Apostle James, the brother of Jesus, old Campbell is this morning. I, I know that for some of you, your minds are racing ahead to the Yabats. Yabat, 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 I pray and it hasn't been powerful. Yabat, Yabat. And what I would like to invite you to do this morning is very, very, very self-consciously engaging 
in focusing on the powerful quality of prayer. And like you sometimes focus on your blessings instead of the hard stuff to stir gratitude in you, I want you to just take a moment and appreciate the power of this according to the page of the scripture. We are going to talk about the Jabbats in February. We're going to talk about it. We're going to take them seriously. We're going to process them because scripture doesn't leave us naked. <laughs> But I think this morning what I wanted to do was bring us back to an almost fresh, virginal perspective on the beauty and power and enormity of prayer in God's economy. And I want to invite you to jettison the baggage as much as you can for a moment and just stare at it in its beauty. What it can do. What it will do. Just enjoy it. I want to lift your faith in prayer as a communication with your Father. I want to lift your faith. Let me say it better. I want to lift your faith in your Father with, who has asked you into prayer. Mommy. So that it can be powerful once again on my side. Father, this is what we ask. This is what we ask. If you feel comfortable, maybe just put your hands open in front of you. Father, this is what we ask. Holy Spirit, would you move our hearts to your vision of prayer? Would you move our hearts towards its power and its effectiveness and its transformative quality? How it is your weapon of warfare in this broken world. And it is mighty to bring down strongholds of the enemy. Would you give us that vision? That the pages of scripture are filled with. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name. And all those people said.